What I would now would like to do is that I introduce a good friend from the Baltic Sea region, Zilja. Zilja is a CCI professional, a researcher, and Zilja, I think we can say that, a really forward thinker. So we had some very good discussions with Zilja in preparing this seminar here, and we really know that you get some brand good news from Zilja. Zilja, it's your turn. I'm super happy to have you. Great. Thank you so much. And really glad to be here. Uh, as told, my name is Celia Sundula, and currently I work at the Southeastern Finland University of Applied Sciences in a lot of EU projects for uh, creative industries. We have a short time, so I won't be going too long there, but I was asked to say something, what I think the main challenges and maybe opportunities, I added that on, for the creative industries at this moment are in my perspective. So in the few minutes I have, I chose two main ones, which have a million off sprints. I think the first challenge, if, if we look at the creative industry sector in general, is still that uh, we tend to always forget that the creative industries is not one sector as such. It's a very heterogeneous uh, sector that actually consists of a number of different subsectors which are very different. If we talk of the content production industries like the digital industries and so forth, there's sort of one sector maybe, but even that not really. Then there's everything from crafts to performing arts and all in between. And I think when we speak of what the challenges for the creative industries are, that these are as different as the different sectors in the creative industries. So it's very, very, difficult and challenging, and maybe we shouldn't look at them. There's a lot of reasons why I think it's a great thing that we have finally in the last 20 or so years started talking of the creative sector as one sector, but they're mainly political reasons. They're not to make us understand the sector better. Otherwise we have to go to the subsectors. So just as a reminder, <clears throat> which sort of leads me uh, to the next sector that it's a very heterogeneous field, but there's some things obviously in commons, the creativity, we're talking about intangible things. And we're talking about things where the actual value is in the meanings behind them. If you buy a painting, you don't, you don't pay for the canvas and the paint, you pay for the intangible meaning that whatever is portrayed on the canvas means to you. And it's always very personal and subjective. And there are other uh, things that are, of course, <clears throat> uh, we share within the creative industries, but therefore also the challenges, the very practical challenges uh, are very different from sector to sector. In general, again, generalization, yes, there's a lot of lack in business skills, in management skills, production skills that there needs work. There's a lot of uh, challenges still on funding instruments, which still tend to not always fit the creative industry's needs and so forth. <clears throat> Uh, but even there, when we talk of business skills, we come back to that the industries are very different. Uh, the business skills is very different if we look at those sectors of arts and culture, for instance, that are both publicly and privately funded. So if we look at traditional arts, or if we take it as an example, the music business, which I know quite a lot from since it's my own background, uh, even the music sector, it's divided into popular music and actual record pro uh, digital production. And it's divided into performing arts and classical music, of which like classical and maybe some folk and other musics are partly always publicly funded, at least in Europe, in our system here. When, if we look at the music, music or gaming industries, those we can sort of compare with businesses and uh, business life of other sectors and they are well doing and there's a lot of startups and so forth, but there's everything in between those sectors. If we look at event production, it's sometimes business may be there and there, but a lot of the times that too is a mix of public funds, of private funds, and if we go further, we look at the business models for a festival, which I think is a great ex example because it consists of so many typical things to some of the creative sectors. A festival, it's one event, so one sort of thing, but behind it, there's often 
maybe a few companies, maybe some NGOs, some public money, some private money, and certainly always volunteers. And for the festival to be put together, you have to actually manage not just one company, but that whole set of different streams of income and outcome and sponsorship and public private money things. And that again is a totally different challenge than running one company, which comes to my actual challenge, which I took on not as just as what is a challenge of the creative industries, but I throw the challenge next to the business people, because a lot of the times there has been this need, we need business skills for creative people. Yes, but the challenge if we go to the business university or business school is that they tend to still come back with business models that lend from a traditional company, one neat company with income, you sell something, you get some income and so forth. That's way too simple for many of the creative industries business uh, challenges. So my challenge is also for business people and economics people to uh, uh, learn more and take on the challenges that the very different and heterogeneous fields of the creative industries have to deal with in practice. Sometimes the creative uh, professionals are very creative in a good way and very skillful management wise. I mean, think uh, of putting up a festival but with sometimes hardly any money and just coming up with it here and there, that demands some real skills and the passion that comes usually from the creative sector. So I think that's definitely a challenge from two perspectives, one. And the second one is uh, if I look at what I really think is the challenge for all of the creative industries is also that the whole world is sort of more and more uh, getting multidisciplinary and things are blending because all of a sudden we can uh, sell different kinds of services and products too, but especially services and intangible products or services again, uh, digitally, almost globally. And in many contexts, it means almost obviously that it's interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary or multidisciplinary things. So I think uh, the creative industries really, uh, the most exciting sort of things comes when they work together with other people or in new contexts. So uh, I think we have a problem with the term creative industries for the reason I just explained. It's not really a problem. It's something that we can never get around quite. But then if we start talking about creative economy or a creative society, we are even more at a challenge to explain that to policymakers to whom we, got, we want to go to, we were just asked, does the, part, the creative industries need funding? And well, that came in second, that funding is needed for the creative industry sector. And it's true uh, in many perspectives, but when we speak of applied arts or culture in different or new settings or multidisciplinary contexts, it's even more difficult politically to explain. So what is the added value? Because the term creative industry sort of came politically to be something because we said, well, it's actually a really big sector. It's better than the automobile sec section and it adds value to other sectors. Well, now when we start working in a multidisciplinary team, you can't put in this much added value, this many cents or euros from the creative industries. You can't count that anymore. And even further, because always when we come to the core values of creative, creative industries, the intangible ones, it's about people's values. It's about how people behave or how they experience or feel about life. Or uh, a good example is like well-being. Are we striving to get more money or are we striving to uh, be happier in our lives, or we, we come to questions that have to do with many of the things that arts and culture is about, values, who we are as human beings, and what this sort of creative society is, because it's only in our minds and in our thinking and in our imagination to be uh, like made of. So I think yeah. that's the next challenge. Yes, I was looking. That was my time. 
but those were my inspirations, hopefully. Thank you very much, uh, Celia. Uh, are there any questions in the chat? I'm not quite sure. Maybe I could uh, ask you one question though, Celia. Um, what do you think would be the uh, biggest challenge uh, and also the, the biggest benefit from, from uh, working internationally or corporate, uh, corporate internationally in, in the creative businesses? Uh, well, I think creative industries by nature are sort of international. I mean, it connects the local with the global artists by all times have uh, been traveling a lot and they take their inspiration from some local and from culture, I mean, people's culture and, and identities and so forth. Uh, and again, I would maybe say when we sp speak of uh, cultural industry exports, for instance, it's not, it's a lot of it is not just the physical going or selling or doing, it's about exchange, exchange of ideas and uh, of what we think as human beings. I mean, think of history without arts and culture. Think if you had to read all of your history lessons without any pictures or paintings or museums, that sort of, I think maybe answers best that question. Very true. Thank you very much. I think we should uh, go on with the, the next speakers. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Celia, for your inspirational uh, thoughts. Um, let's uh, focus on the creative ports right now. Um, I've personally not been involved in, in the project, so I'm uh, very uh, keen on, on learning more about the project. And uh, we are fortunate enough to have uh, two of the biggest experts uh, with us today, uh, Adjam Tedros from uh, the Swedish Institute and uh, Larry Serene now in the city of Sipo. Um, Adjam was the in the advisory board. Welcome to you, Adjam. Uh, Adjam was uh, in the advisory board of the, the Creative Port, uh, Ports project, uh, whereas Larry was uh, the coordinator uh, for the lead for the lead partner, uh, which was uh, the Goethe Institute. Um, so let's go right through uh, to it. Uh, Adrian, please, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you. And thank you for having me. It, it's uh, a pleasure to address you here today. And, and I really appreciate the opportunity to present a project that I think is really great. Uh, as you mentioned, Christian, I was part of the advisory board uh, of this project. And uh, if one can say something about the Baltic Sea region is that it's characterized by, by strong and diverse, of course, national and regional cultures. It has diversity in all the different forms and shape, and of course, enormous artistic talent. And so the Creative Ports project wanted to, to um, support the ongoing international collaborations in the region. And one of the outputs that I will just briefly present to you now was a set of policy recommendations. There were 26, I won't go over all of them, uh, but I'll just present them in, in different clusters. Uh, and before I do that though, just to say that uh, what I think was really good about these recommendations was uh, as usual, uh, recommendations uh, of, of this kind is, is meant to inspire policymakers to adjust and improve uh, different policies and strategies. And this was also an objective of these recommendations, but they also wanted to inspire other stakeholders and really clearly recognize that there were such stakeholders, the enablers uh, to take action. Uh, if we look at, at the first set of recommendations, they wanted to, to stress the importance of building conditions for value creation. And how do you do that? Well, it can be about setting up different incubators, accelerators program that does target these CSI actors directly, but also, and as we saw in the poll, there were a lot of, of uh, recommendations that had to do with the importance of putting legal frameworks in place that not only support co-creation, but at the same time, make sure that the creative's intellectual properties are protect protected. And, and as usual, there were also the very important recommendations of assuring that fair payment for work carried out was, was paid then. Um, Another set of recommendations had to do with the importance of providing internationalization support. And this was also something that we saw in the pool that was just uh, needed out, uh, asked 
as to, to rate different issues. For instance, the capacity building issue, not only when it comes to creative skills, but also in, in business skills, also touched upon by Celia. This was something that Creative Ports stressed. Uh, Creative Ports really talked about the intermediaries uh, as the enablers of the CCI actors and wanted to, to have a recommendations that really emphasize that their knowledge of different markets and regulations, as well as their networks needed to be strengthened. Uh, and there were a fourth set of recommendations that had a lot to do with the importance of supporting new innovation ecosystem for CSI and integrating the CCIs into existing innovations ecosystems. Now, the fifth and final recommendation had to do specifically with the CCI sector itself. And here it was a lot of recommendations that dealt with the importance of, of including them in the local, regional and national strategies so that they don't become an add on, but that it's built in. And so in sum, these are quite easy to grasp and very useful policy recommendations and, and um, I would also like to mention that they were developed in the same inclusive co-creative manner that it prescribes us to work. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. Very interesting. So I think we'll go right to uh, Larry uh, then. Yes, hi, uh, on my side as well. I'm Larry Siran. Um, and as Christian mentioned, I'm, uh, I was the project manager for uh, the Creative Ports project for the nearly three years it ran. Um, and, um, and I was working for the Goethe Institute at the time, uh, who, who was the lead partner of Creative Ports. Um, and we had a great and really heterogeneous partnership of 14 different partners from throughout the Baltic Sea region, uh, which also enabled this co-creating manner of, of doing things, which uh, Adia mentioned in, in, in her, uh, her note. Um, I will now present to you um, something concrete. We got out of the creative ports. We have, of course, many outputs. Uh, and um, I would like to advertise the, the online platform creativeports.eu. Uh, go there, uh, it's full of resources to uh, take into, uh, into your use, uh, cost-free, of course. Uh, and I, I think it's a great source for, uh, for also these concrete tools uh, to be used in, in your everyday work and life. Um, maybe the main thing we did, um, uh, maybe the main output, one, one or at least one of the most important outputs, where these so-called uh, internationalization tools. So we gathered uh, tools, um, meaning projects, uh, initiatives, programs, um, uh, you name it, uh, anything you use to support the creative, uh, uh, creative companies in your region. Uh, so so the, the concrete tools the intermediary organizations use and we collected these from all of our project partners. Uh, it's concluded to be over 100 tools. And uh, then we just chose the 10 best and piloted them, uh, gathered material on them, and created learning material based on them. And that's all to be found uh, in uh, our Creative Ports online platform. And I will now really briefly present you three uh, of these 10 tools. They might be the most exciting, or then they are just good examples of, uh, of different kinds of tools. Uh, this is, by the way, the online platform I'm showing you right now. So uh, you can see it's not only easy to use, but also beautiful. Um, this is the first tool, uh, Pitching for a Better Baltic Sea. Um, pitching for a Better Baltic Sea uh, is a uh, program consisting of pitching contest, training, uh, event, and a B2B program. Uh, and uh, the idea was to create cross-sectoral cross collaborations uh, between the creatives and, uh, and creative intermediaries in the Baltic Sea region. And we actually realized this uh, tool 
twice. Uh, we did it in uh, an analog format uh, in uh, Aarhus uh, in 2019. And then during the pand pandemic in 2020, we did it in a digital form. So even though we were hit by the pandemic very uh, severely, uh, we, we couldn't realize almost any of our, our physical pilots and events, we were able to do that in digital form. Um, and and we, we really uh, got lots of information and experience from these two formats, and it's all to be found here on, on the Creative Arts online platform. Um, so pitching competition uh, and uh, also sharing information on uh, how to pitch your products, how to uh, how to create, create this uh, business skills, which uh, were also underlined in the, in the uh, poll we answered uh, in the beginning of this seminar. So that's one of the tools. This was hosted by the Danish Cultural Institute, one of our project partners. Then we move on to Sweden, uh, the MESS Festival. Also during the, uh, during the darkest times of the pandemic, uh, and uh, we uh, we had this uh, project partner, Media Evolution from Malmö, who really uh, know how to organize festivals. They have uh, the con uh, festivals called the conference and the festival, uh, which are organized uh, annually or biannually. Now I'm not sure, but at least they gather a lot of uh, different kind of creatives and cross-sectoral experts in Malmö. And now during the pandemic, they came up with this completely new format Mesh Festival, which was a virtual pick and mix festival. So they actually uh, set out a line of lineup of talks, uh, workshops, roundtable discussions, and this was completed by a own an own TV channel. So they had this Mesh TV format, and they had live program throughout the, the days uh, on offer, and. Uh, Free, uh, free entrance to all, and uh, this brought experts from throughout the Baltic Sea region together to meet around this one virtual table in, in a relatively uh, relaxed format in comparison to Zoom or Teams talks. Um, yeah, then uh, one more tool, Sustainable Design Lab, organized by our dear friends and project partners uh, from Hamburg. Hamburg Kreativgesellschaft, uh, um, and this um, was actually a, a international prototyping lab, lab for designers of different disciplines. So once again, the, we had this cross-sectoral approach there, um, and um, it brought together designers from three cities. So Mikkeli, Riga, and um, and Hamburg were participating, and um, they had the uh, task of creating, uh, co-creating in this lab in three, these three sessions, uh, uh, sustainable city design. And they also had concrete uh, examples from these three cities, especially uh, from, uh, from Hamburg. And you can see a video here on the online platform, as well as uh, additional information on, on uh, this, this lab. And um, to conclude, uh, all these uh, all these uh, tools are to be found on the online platform. They are really easy to use, and it's a broad mix of different formats. So take a look and pick yours, and uh, start uh, helping your your uh, your companies to and creatives to become international. Also, there are learning modules, so you don't just need. It's not just dry text read out, uh, but you have videos, you have interviews, and you have also contact information. So it's really uh, meant to uh, be in the assistance for the intermediaries in the cultural and creative industries. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you for giving us all these information on the Creative Ports project. And thank you for doing such a fantastic job in organizing this fascinating project. This is very much to the success of it. So, and Adam, you will say that I'm right. When we were sitting together in the advisory board of this Creative Ports project, 
we said one of the tasks we have is not to let it vanish away as so many Interreg and other EU funded projects, not to have some results, not to have recommendations and then throw them away. But we said from the very beginning on with all partners that it has to go on. And the idea was to create a one-stop shop for all this hydrogen creative industries within Baltic Sea region to give them support, visibility, and yes, a kind of lobbying for this very important industrial sector. If you look at all these chambers of commerce and industry and whatever you have all over the region, you don't have that for creative industries. And thanks to Good Institute in Tallinn, they have changed the whole story. And I would like to introduce you to a short film about this new splendid offer you as a creative from Baltic Sea region will have from now on. Creative Ports, the CCI contact desk. In Creative Ports, we are dedicated to accelerate the internationalization of culture and creative industries in the Baltic Sea region. As one of the key pillars in our strategy, we've set up the CCI Contact Desk. From its home port at the Goethe Institute in Tallinn, Estonia, the desk connects several of the most important actors in the creative sphere. Public administrations like city governments, business support organizations like startup incubators, and national cultural institutes. As the nexus of this Baltic Sea-wide network, the desk works together with its partners to facilitate the uptake of the project outputs, continues to mobilize local CCI stakeholders, and plan joint activities. Most importantly, the contact desk offers its partners information, contacts, and inspiration to cooperate across borders to help realize their goals, or even to set new ones. The desk is the go-to hub for the cultural and creative industries in the BSR. It keeps you up to date with a monthly newsletter, social media posts, and funding possibilities for the CCI. It also provides an online platform with news, an event calendar, learning modules for implementing the Creative Ports internationalization tools, and an online forum to talk to peers. Ships Ahoy! We believe that face-to-face -face exchange is indispensable in the creative industries. This is why the desk organizes a network meeting every year for its partner organizations, as well as internships and job shadowing. And last but not least, inspiration. The contact desk shares good practices for internationalization and initiates joint projects to open new markets for Baltic Sea creative industries, bringing people together to learn from each other and create new ideas. Join us and support the cultural and creative industries to set sail in the Baltic Sea region. Find out more at creativeports.eu. Well, this was the result we were aiming for with the project. Adiam, Ulrich, I think we can say that. And this is thanks to Good Institute. You are doing really doing the right thing for the creative industries within Baltic Sea region and beyond by now. And it's fantastic to have the managing director of CCI Desk in Tallinn here with Ulrich. Ulrich, how can one reach you, the desk? How can you make it usable to the world? Yeah, hello everybody. Thank you, Wolfgang, for the presentation. I'm very happy that we could organize this seminar together with UBC and we have the possibility to disseminate the results of the Creative Port project. As you already heard, it's one of the output of the project to have this contact us. And uh, one of the main goals is to disseminate the results. We heard some uh, points already in the first session. And uh, we started in January, so it's a new work unit um, with, yeah, in a sense, under construction, but we have a five years period and we hope to to, to can support and be able to do work in the sense of creative ports. Larry already mentioned the central platform, creativeports.eu, and there you can find the link, connect to the CCI contact us. You should use this link. And uh, so if any questions remain open at the end of today's seminar, use this opportunity and uh, connect to the CCI contact us. You will answer 
and you will answer rapidly. And um, if necessary, we put you in touch with right people uh, who can help you. So that is our main task. And uh, I'm very happy to answer your question. Please use this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ulrich, and thank you for this fantastic opportunity. But be aware, you will be flooded with questions from all over the region from this moment on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if it's okay to you, it's perfect for us. So let's move to our panel. We put, as you have already seen, we have some fascinating speakers. We have practitioners, we have deep thinkers, and uh, we have people who are working in the CCI industry for a very long time. And with this, I would like to give over to you, Adrian, because you said all these fascinating people are on the panel and it was you to bring them into the room. So it's up to you to bring the questions to them. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, and um, thank you for this opportunity. I, I very much look forward to having this discussion with, with you panelists. And, and so just to give you a presentation of who it is we have with us on stage. Uh, you just heard Lari Siren present uh, the Creative Ports project, and, and he was the former project manager for Creative Ports, and that's when our paths crossed. And currently, uh, Lari is the operations director for Built Environment in the municipality of, of Sipo in Finland. And he's the go-to person when it comes both to questions of regional development, but also uh, when it comes to questions of how to promote international collaboration within the creative sector. And that's what we'll be focusing on today. Uh, I would also like to introduce our second panelist, uh, Celia Suntula, who you also heard speaking. And, and she was quite modest that she has a very strong background within the creative sector. Among other things, she's coordinated the implementation of the Finnish National Creative e Economy Strategy. Uh, she currently works uh, with international research development and innovation projects at the Creative Industries Research Unit at Southeastern Finland University of Applied Scientists. And, and Celia is quite active in furthering the discussions between policymakers, developers, entrepreneurs on the challenges and opportunities. And, and we did get a taste of that earlier. So we'll continue that discussion. And our third panelist is Egbert Ruhl. Uh, he's the managing director of Hamburg Creative Gesellschaft uh, that Laurie also introduced uh, in his presentation. And, and this is a municipal company promoting the creative industry in, in Hamburg. And uh, Egbert has extensive experience from different management and creative positions, as you will hear him very shortly. Uh, he's managed uh, to improve the conditions vastly for creatives uh, and by doing one important thing and that is to establish networks between the creatives and the different sub-markets but also other actors from business, politics and society. Welcome to all of you. And so just to get us started, uh, we're here today to talk about the internationalization of the creative and culture industry in, in the Baltic Sea region. So how are we doing? Can you just, you know, uh, let's start with you, Lari. What's the temperature? Is it warm? Is it hot? Is it cold? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I um, I would say it's uh, it's getting hot in here. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's um, I I think we have a really rich uh, and multifaceted uh, industry here. We have lots of tradition. We have. Uh, lots of small actors uh, throughout the region. We have really great examples on, let's say, design or music or or also for some cross-sectoral uh, stuff, uh, which, uh, which uh, for instance, Hamburg is promoting uh, strongly. Um, so it's it's quite getting uh, uh, quite good. It's it's quite good. But then again, uh, we uh, somehow we. Our, our companies are almost all small and medium enterprises, so we lack the big, uh, big guys, so to say, uh, which is of course okay. But uh, I think we have a chance there to, uh, get, to to be even better, to be even greater, and create more added value. Um, also, um, 
I think we still lack in international contacts. So we need to enhance still the internationalization in the cultural and creative industries here. So we mainly work locally. Internationalization and also cooperation between the regions in, in one nation. And that would be my recipe. Hmm. We'll get back to that. Uh, but let's do the temperature check also with you, Egbert. So quite hot where Larry is. How do you feel? So it's it's difficult to answer this question. I must say, um, so it depends, as Larry said, on, let's say, the structure and size of companies. And um, we know that uh, smaller companies, self-employees, um, freelancers um, normally work within local uh, value change uh, systems. And um, on the other hand, um, digitalization means internationalization. And so everybody has a chance uh, to address an international market through digital systems. But on the other hand, um, we have to think about overload for, for those small structures. This means normally overload. They do have the possibilities to uh, work within this digital um, possibilities, but um, they have to decide if they should focus their core business, what is making music or painting pictures or, or being an illustrator or web designer or addressing uh, the international markets within digitalization. And so we, we have to aware that um, maybe new uh, business systems will be rising up. So we see this in what we call creator economy um, where single persons, journalists, authors, influencers um, uh, are successful in um, uh, using the digital systems and they don't need um, editorials, publishers, things like this. But around them, they need people that help them to attract this international system. So it is a, a very difficult picture to paint. Yeah, I understand. But but uh, uh, a very good image that you presented to us, Egbert. Thank you for that. Um, and what's your perspective, Celia? Um, yes, as Egbert said, I think it's a very uh, complex question, but uh, Egbert brought up a very important point here, I think, about digitalization, that there's really a lot of layers to digitalization and how the creative industries can benefit from it. Uh, I've always said that culture in the end is always a people business. And if we think of digitalization, like you said, yes, there are many sectors where you can actually, you know, you can produce your own stuff. You can do the, all the editorials or the, the digital stuff and basically in a format that you could sell all over the globe. But in very many creative fields still, especially since many sectors are very small to start with, whether it's companies or freelancers or anything in between, uh, networks are really important. Networks between uh, creators, networks between colleagues, networks between potential customers. And I think if we at least one time mentioned the COVID pandemic in this seminar, if it taught us something, it's that internationalization doesn't always, sometimes yes, but not always mean traveling. I think creatives especially definitely benefit from it. I'm not, not saying that, but there's a lot more that we can do through virtual communications than we did before the pandemic. I've always said no strategy could have done, made that happen. <laughs> yeah. The pandemic for it to be, I've said like internationalization in one sense moved next door because you can call the person in Italy at the same token you can call. And I would challenge this um, onto the challenge uh, pointer here, I suppose, that also when we think of the creative industry support systems and services, that how could we also virtually uh, network small actors? Uh, when I was doing the Creative Industries Finland program in Finland and 
even nationally, it is a challenge that the sector or the actors and doers are far and few between, in between. Mm. So if it's a challenge in nationally, definitely is internationally. But as said, in the pandemic, it's, we learned that it's not that much harder to network digitally to some point. And of course, yes, I, I like, so I would bring that as a sort of thinking hat that how could we also provide services for creative actors to network like this, like we're doing now. But that's such a good question. Let's elaborate on that. Yeah, Laurie. What do you say? Yeah, just to uh, continue on what Celia said, I mean, the, the networks really are the key issue here and the linkages uh, on a national level. Yes, they we still uh, lack behind also on national level in, I would say, all in the of the Baltic Sea region countries. Uh, but then the international level, uh, there are only few players there. There are just a handful of strong players uh, who, who, who work for this linkages uh, and we really need a broader group and army there and uh, one key to this is then the recognition of cultural and creative industries all together so that we really show that cultural and creative industries is a big uh, industry with also a lot of added value uh, this is important on uh, eu level it's uh, important on baltic sea region level and this enables uh, then the lower level so to say to, to connect multinationally uh, far better. What, what, what do you say, Egbert? Are these valid points? Yeah. I, I think on, on the level of, um, of creating uh, content, I, I would say networks could be very helpful. On the other hand, uh, if we speak economically, we, we have to think about access to markets. And um, it, this means how to get, as a freelancer, access to an international market. How do networks may help you with this? And how can you manage, uh, for example, different rules and regulations and um, and monetization and, and things like this. So, um, yeah, we, we know access to markets is for the smaller structure of, of people that work in creative industries, for those uh, self-employees, uh, freelancers, are the, the biggest challenge at all. So they do have, they, they do have problems to to go to have an access to market, even in local systems. This is on the biggest challenge ever for every people that work in creative industries. Maybe it comes out that they start, that they are so self-driven, though they are not focused on markets. They do things that they want to do. They paint pictures that they want to paint. And after having done this, they look for markets. Um, so in, in maybe the traditional businesses, it's an other way around. So you look to markets and then you make your product. In creative mm -hmm. industries, you make your product and look for markets. And um, so, so internationalization may mean that your market has become uh, bigger and bigger, but are you able to handle it, to, to, to handle this overload? And uh, maybe networking is a, is a good idea, um, uh, but do we have examples that this works successfully? So uh, I don't know, we should work on this. Mm -hmm. So to help those people to, to use international markets, but it's, it isn't easy, I must say. Yeah. And definitely what I also hear you say is that it's not enough, uh, that, that something else is needed in addition to these networks. And, and that brings me to you, Celia, uh, because in, when I spoke to you, you, you did mention a, an approach that you have in Finland that, that perhaps locks up some of these uh, challenges that we're talking about, the phenomenon approach. Could you please ex just expand on that? 
Yeah, I was uh, maybe move on sort of to the next subject. So not directly tied to this, uh, when uh, I was just uh, saying that in general, I believe that one uh, big challenge in our overall society is that we are very silo focused when again the services or the big challenges global challenges or the so-called wicked problems they're much much larger phenomena than any one sector can solve and I was sort of saying that I think that creative industries uh, the bigger markets in general now I'm not speaking about any specific sector is really uh creating or being able to see and identify places where their skills could be used also in new ways, which means multidisciplinary teams and so forth. And in general, in Finland, there's uh, in education, this uh, new education, new education, not so new anymore, but something called phenomena-based learning as an example of an approach to what it could mean in education and and creation where in schools, for instance, it's mandatory that a certain amount of lessons in, in basic grades are taught instead of subjects like arts, math, biology. It's phenomena. Look at this phenomena, climate change or smaller phenomena. And then the pupils uh, come together and solve the phenomena or create solutions for the phenomena. Somebody could call, isn't it challenge-based learning or project-based learning? Well, that too, but calling it why it's called phenomena-based learning, it's that you learn at the same time, to sort of a- analyze the world and look at phenomena that happen in different contexts, like anywhere or any place. And I think that uh, it's just a in- very interesting uh, approach from the perspective that what could it mean for the creative sector? What new uh, opportunity it is could it mean for the creative industries? For instance, I've often used it as an example. How could the creative industries be involved in the, all our challenges for sustainability, the green economy, hmm. where it's not just about actually coming up with a new innovation. It's also about uh, having people, making them want to live, thinking like making it personal to pe- people. But again, culture and creative industries have a lot to do in how, what people's lifestyle are. Do they feel it's cool? And, and is that the, like in line with their values? Even just start, starting from something sort of so uh, maybe corny, but a lot of young people follow their idols and how what their values are do affect the, their their uh, followers and their fans, but also in general, just there are many artists that are really inspired by nature and the environment and the everything around us. And I think that has a change. So culture actually has uh, the power to change behaviors, how we live and what we want to, how we want to live. And that's a huge, uh, that has a huge matter in this equation. I could use second time to mention COVID is that it's one thing to come up with the vaccine, but then it's another one to want to people to take the vaccine, which we know this wasn't actually so simple. <laughs> so I, I sort of challenge for to think of educational skills like through phenomena in the world that we actually want to affect and what our skills could yield to that whole conversation around the phenomena. And that would be something really meaningful that I think the creative industries uh, would have much to give in. Hmm. Very interesting. Well, what's your reflection, Laurie, when you hear Celia presented in this manner? Well, my thoughts, uh, I could uh, summarize it, amen. Uh, I, I uh, agree with that uh, very strongly. and. Um, that's also something we really thought a lot about in the beginning of the Creative Courts project. Uh, as we, uh, for instance, when we were uh, gathering these different internationalization tools from, from our partners in different regions, we first categorized them uh, in the, after the subsector. We had like music tools, and then we had 
like uh, media industry tools and uh, gaming industry tools. And then uh, we just um, started thinking, oh, wait, this could work for the other subsector as well. Mm. Could a gaming incubation program actually support music industry companies, etc.? And we uh, decided, uh, actually, it was only two m- months into the project or something, we decided to scrap all these subcategories, subsectors, and uh, think horizontally. Just everything we did, we did for the cultural and creative industries. And uh, to also emphasize, emphasize what Celia mentioned, it's also so beyond uh, uh, like these core va- values or, or cross-cutting uh, teams and topics like sustainability are of course uh, also important in this uh, let's say holistic uh, approach uh, mm-hmm. and then um, also actors outside uh, the, the uh, traditional creative industries uh, bringing when you bring in uh, for instance someone from the manufacturing industry uh, mm-hmm. You have all the possibilities in the world when you co-create something. And uh, I already endorsed Egbert and the, the Hamburg crew on this uh, cross-sectoral approach. But I think it's really one of the core things when we uh, try to develop the industry in the, in the Baltic Sea region. Also, when we think cross-sectorally, when we bring the outsiders in, uh, so to say, and go out, outside ourselves, we work better together inside the industry. We, we start yeah. asking ourselves the questions, why wouldn't we work with the, with the gaming industry, even though we're just, uh, just designers here, um, you know? Yeah, definitely. Uh, the importance of challenging oneself in that sense. And, and you mentioned, Larry, the, the Hamburg Creative Gesellschaft as, as one good example. Uh, Egbert, why don't you... Just shed light on what was it that you did and, and how were you so successful? What's the recipe? So, yeah, within this 12 years existing Hamburg Kreativ Gesellschaft, we developed a lot of different tailor-made offers to our customers. So it, it starts from access to finance, access to real estate, which is maybe the most important thing in this growing and, and expansive city like Hamburg to, to help people finding spaces to work at the uh, places for rehearsals and musicians and uh, theaters, makers and dancers, but also just offices for, for the game uh, producers and things like this. And it is, of course, access to markets. And, and we started this um, innovation program that is split into two different departments. One cares about how to foster innovation within creative industries, how to help those people, uh, especially those smaller uh, structures to think about how can, how do my business model is, can be successful within digital um, economy. So how can I transform my business model into digital systems? And the other um, uh, thing is the other department is um, to to, um, foster um, innovation in the cooperation between creative industries and other branches. And it is hardcore industries. We work together uh, to to foster innovation in early processes, in early stage of processes, in in innovation processes. And we have done this successfully within the last five years with over 100 partners. And this shows um, and highlights the the capacity of of creative industries to be drivers of innovation, not within only the creative industries, but also within all other branches. And it is much more effective and, and faster than the traditional innovation systems as um, research and development, things like this. We, we can do it within, if you bring people from creative industry together with, with industries to work on uh, concrete challenges, they can find results within weeks and have prototyping and things like this. And, it, it's wonderful to see this potential and, and this can help 
So to overcome silos and all those things that Sila mentioned. So yeah, and, and it, it works, I must say. Yeah, that's so impressive to hear of, of, of the progress. And, and it's also an example of how local government really has taken on the, the role of, of creating this enabling environment. And, um, and, and so perhaps just to, to Larry or, or Celia, do you see that others, uh, municipalities are following suit? Is, is, you know, Hamburg alone in this or what, you know, what's going on in our region? Well, I would say uh, that uh, there are uh, there are some to follow up. Somebody has to be the pioneer and uh, go the path before the others uh, may follow someone. Uh, and uh, we are getting there, but at the same time, we we still need to somehow share these positive uh, uh, examples and good pra practices in order to uh, create a broader army there. Yes, I would agree on that, that I think a lot has happened in the last 10 or 20 years, definitely, but there's still much to do. And it, it's all, always about individual people that, you know, one city happens to have those drivers that push forward those things. So there's still, I think also, it depends still on the concrete place. So much to do, but also we can be happy about where we are. Yeah, and uh, to add to that, I mean, the, the uh, cities and municipalities, uh, it's all the same if they're the size of Hamburg or if they're the size, size of, uh, let's say, Mikkeli in Finland. Uh, they're, the, the tools and the, the connections in the national programs, they are scalable. You can, you can always do it in a smaller or bigger scale. So it, it's, it's open for everyone, so to say. And so just uh, to, to then continue with uh, the question of, of this regional international networks or international networks that you all were alluding to, saying that, you know, it's important that we have them in place in order to make that connection outside of our region. Uh, well, how, how, you know, what, what role can we play? What, what, do you have any ideas of, of next step in terms of that? I could continue, <clears throat> continue quickly. I think intermediaries are definitely needed for many reasons that we just spoke. There are a lot of small actors and so forth. And also because there are many sectors and we have to all, always keep in mind the, fa the, the, things, the fact that we talked about that it's a heterogeneous field. It, there's no one answer for everybody, but, but still within that intermediacy have a very important role. And... <clears throat> Also, like for instance, when we discuss that networks in general are important, it's also uh, understanding that for instance, um, the, the deeper you are in your own sector, uh, the so, sort of more specific needs for internationalization you have. So say like if a rock manager is really ready to take his or her bands abroad and build, he needs specific connections to very specific people and actors and uh, not going to you know benefit from getting help to go to a crafts uh, a festival or something like that but on the other hand there's a need for more cross-sector collaboration and so forth so there's needs for intermediaries on all level like across within the industries across to other sectors and then sort of uh, the connections that can guide also to those that have deeper uh, connections within specific silos so it's a huge field and intermediaries are needed everywhere hmm. but they should play different roles as your or, or yeah yeah that is not one answer for all that mm -hmm. we have to sort of remember that there's there, there's many needs but i also think intermediaries when when we speak of small business they can really also fit from going to networking trips or whatever fairs uh, together so I, I do think that small actors would benefit from also like trying to sell their things rather through networking, especially in small countries. I think the music business and gaming industry have done really well, like in Finland and on, with Nordic countries, that they have really strong 
gaming organizations or music export, which is now Nordic music export and so forth. So they're a good example of sectors that have also sector specific uh, structures and hence intermediaries. Very good. Any other ideas on or, or concrete ideas on, on what we should do in order to advance this issue? Maybe I, I can uh, mention uh, the, that there is a need of advocacy for the creative industries. And um, so I can say we have a, a, a gap of, of uh, on, even on the local, but also on the, on the level of federal states and especially on the national level in Germany, there isn't any advocacy for creative industries at all. So we have some advocacy for some special branches. Of course, we have some uh, associations for, for gaming industries and music and things like this, but we don't have this for creative industries, even on, on the level of, of uh, cities. So um, I think uh, creative industries have to work on this to, to become more, to get more influence on, on policy making. Mm -hmm. So there, there had been, on, on the other side, I, I must say, the EU looks very concrete to creative industries. There had been a, 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 a parallel uh, uh, conference just now, European Creative Industries Summit, where Ursula von der Leyen spoke about creative industries and the importance of creative industries within the EU. So it is on the very high, on the highest level in EU. But I must say, in Germany, we don't have this on a national level. So maybe Germany is so um, engineering-driven, car building, I don't know. <laughs> so maybe it's better in, in Finland or Estonia, I don't know. But um, so we, we have some, some struggle on this. So, so there is a... Um, uh, awareness and appreciation for creative industries is in Germany sometimes on these are just the artists and, but we as car builders speak about economy so what do mm. you want yeah. yeah that's very interesting so yeah. how is it in Finland then Larry how, how is how does it work with advocacy uh, well not good enough uh, I mean <laughs> Uh, there's some uh, some advocacy on national level, uh, but we are talking about small things uh, uh, when we compare it with the traditional industries, so to say. Uh, we, we, yeah. we are really, really little actor there, and uh, that's something we should work on. Um, there are challenges, um, and um, I agree that this advocacy question is really important. Uh, and the overall recognition of, of, uh, of cultural and creative industries as, as an industry um, and as a value creator and also business creator, as a, not just creating art for the art, but also creating added value for the, for the regions. Um, and what I see as, as our benefit is that we uh, lack the traditional structures and, and maybe the uh, also suffo some, sometimes suffocating uh, tradition uh, and we are more agile uh, agile actor we uh, we can uh, for instance take take this digitalization and move fast forward we can really uh, create new international structures since we don't have these strong national structures preventing this uh, we we can make cross regional and cross sectoral uh, 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 cooperation. So we have chances there. Uh, we have possibilities there, even though we're not there yet. Thank you, Lari. And and so just to kind of, you know, time flies when you're having uh, very interesting conversations, but just to, to let you finish up, uh, if we were to invite you to a new panel uh, regarding the, the conditions and how to spark internationalization, what would be uh, the one thing that you would stress? I'm going to force you to choose one thing. And I'll start with uh, you, Celia. Uh, well, I would almost sum it up in the last two, um, uh, what Egbert and Larry had to say, that I do think overall awareness raising and understanding across policymakers and developers 
besides the actual actors, about what creative industries is, what it can mean in economically in other sectors, but not even stop there, but be what creative society uh, means and what it can mean. So the opportunities, I think it's still fairly not very well understood. There's a lot of interest. And as said on EU level, it's noticed that yes, that is like we realize we have to be creative and innovative, but we do need much, much more talk and understanding of what it can mean for ourselves and for the policymakers. Thank you, Celia. And, and you, saw, uh, Larry. Yeah, I would say maybe um, um, added, the added value of internationalization in the sense of making business. Uh, I, would, I would stress the importance of, of international connections and broadening the market uh, for, for the, uh, the, the CCI actors. Uh, for instance, if you're running a design uh, agency in, in Latvia, you have the whole region as your as your uh, possible clients, and uh, this is something we should work on, not to keep you on the Latvian market or on the local market, but to connect you with Kiel and to connect you with Aarhus, and then uh, you have really this one uh, general market, and that's a lot of added value uh, in euros. A more global-born thinking thing. Yeah. Thanks, Larry, and Egbert. So I must say, I, I, I would discuss two things. The one is, so everybody and really every company in the world um, says they, they want to become a content creator. So even car makers or things, everybody want to, to become now a content creator. And I, I want to discuss what does this mean? for creative industries and, and for those companies. This is the one layer. And the other one is how to become, to overcome the national borders, uh, even in Baltic Sea region, for example, to present creative industries international. Though from the per perspective of China, they, they even don't know that there are different countries around this Baltic Sea. So, so <laughs> What it means. So it is. It is a very local perspective we do have. And if we look from from international from an international perspective, we we have to to throw our possibilities and capacity together and to to have a chance on international markets. I must. Mm. Thank you so much, and thanks for a very engaged discussion. I learned a lot and. Uh, and thank you also for, for providing uh, the organizers with new topics. Uh, I'm sure you'll all be invited. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you all. And I can say this was really a fantastic panel. I've learned a lot and I've learned from content creators. Not only what a content creator is, but I've learned from real content creators. Thank you for that. So um, you have talked about that pandemic. I think this is something we have to stress because we are on our way back to life. As you might know, we have a fantastic startup and future festival here in Kiel, the Vatican Festival. And this is an opportunity where UBC is also engaged in. And this festival brings more than 1000 content creators and business people and people from all over the region from different perspectives to Kiel for a day. And um, yeah, you are, you are those people who helped us as UBC Smart and Prospering Cities Commission over this hard time of the pandemic. Immediately, we had to stop the seminars we always had physically in some interesting cities, and then we had to move digital. And you were the ones who helped us to make something new of it. So we learned you helped us, and we would like to say thank you by inviting you with a VIP ticket and a good VIP program to UBC, to the Vatican Festival here in Kiel in June 2022, and a written form will follow. I will hope to see you as our content creators and, of course, all the rest of the seminar too in Kiel. So thank you so much. Christian, what would you say? It's, I would say it's time for a wrap up of this seminar. Um, it would be interesting how you see it. We said that capacity building is very important in this aspect. 
We have learned that the internationalization of this thing, digitalization, of course. What do you say? Can UBC, Union of the Baltic Cities, this alliance of more than 70 cities around the Baltic Sea region, and our commission here help in this? Can we become a driving force in this aspect? Sure, because I think it's very important that we learn from each other uh, so that we don't invent the wheel, each of us. Um, so we learn from each other, we get inspired by each other. And I think one of the main of one of my main uh, takes from from this seminar today is that uh, there is no uh, one size fits all. Uh, it's a very diverse group. And that means it takes a lot of leadership from a city uh, or a region or uh, other external partners uh, to create something and to to push forward uh, also the internationalization of uh, of the creative industries so um, this puts a lot of pressure on on us as cities uh, and uh, but i mean we uh, we learn from the best today and uh, i think uh, this uh, just uh, inspires us to to do even more I completely agree, Christian. Thank you. I thank our wonderful speakers. I thank you, Adiam, as a moderator. Hope that we will all see you, also our audience, which I thank at Vatican Festival here in Kiel in June. And I can tell you, it will be something magic. Find all the information, as always, on our UBC Smart and Prospering Cities website. And hope to see you soon again, either in Kiel or in our autumn seminar this year. Thank you so much. And bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot.